former general manager of the Los Angeles Dodgers, and not, not just any, a man who had uh, a winning record in eight of his nine seasons uh, in the chair, and the author of The Big Chair, The Smooth Hops and Bad Bounces from the Inside World of the Acclaimed Los Angeles Dodgers General Manager that you can still get on bookstores online everywhere. Uh, TV analyst for Sportsnet LA, Ned Coletti, here in the flesh. Good to see you again, Ned. Good to see you, Rich. Always a pleasure. All right, let's start. Let's start uh, with the defending National League champs right now. Eight games back, Ryu now uh, out until the All-Star break. Seager out for the year. Turner, we don't know when he's going to be back. Uh, I mean, I guess the list could go on and on. What, what is your thoughts on uh, the Dodgers' start so well, far? Well, it's obviously been a rough start after a great year, a year ago. Uh, injuries always play into it. Injuries are always a, a piece of it, no doubt. But they, they've been hit harder than most, and uh, they've got a lot of depth in their organization, but I think the way that they've they've had the injuries hit, it's going to be difficult without getting guys back to really get back on track. So eight out right now. Well, what's yeah. your what's your history in being on a team that's eight out you know, the first I, half of the season? I go back to the 2013 season at one point in time, late June, really. We were uh, Don Mattingly was our manager. Um, people were thinking he was going to get fired. He, he didn't. Uh, he continued to to right the ship. We were, I think, 12 out and nine, nine and a half, or 12 under 500 and nine and a half games out in late June. So many different things are going to happen. The blessing and the curse of baseball, you play it every day. So the blessing and the curse of baseball is you evaluate it every day. And if you evaluate it too quick, you'll make mistakes. That said, the team has been under 500 for a while, and they do have a lot of injuries. They got to get Turner back. That's probably three weeks away. Logan Forsythe, get him back. I still think they're going to make a run at it. They know how to win. Arizona learned a little bit last year how to win. Mm -hmm. But they still, Dodgers have got a good pedigree, a great culture, great manager in Roberts. So I think they'll make it a race before it's over. What's your read on why Corey Seager got the injury that he got? The you know, injury. a shortstop is uh, it's probably the one position that you throw from so many different arm slots. And you, you throw quick and you have to throw accurate and obviously hard. You got to have, except for the catcher and maybe a right fielder, probably your best arm is your shortstop. And I think just to wear and tear different things like that, they, they accumulate. And I think that's what, that's what happened to Corey. Uh, he obviously did not want to have this happen. Um, he was hurting last year and decided against the surgery because he thought he could heal. He wasn't prepared to, to do what uh, what nature is going to make him do. So it's not because he's at the spinal tap 11 and he couldn't dial it back with all the extra swings? That had nothing to do with it, you don't think? Uh, I don't think so. So no. it's really just an arm angle from the yeah, shortstop position? I, I think so. I think it's I think it's that. I think when you think about pitchers, pitchers hardly ever hit. And yet, and that that's where most of the Tommy John surgeries are coming from. So I, I do think it's a throwing a throwing issue. I think that's that's most of it. And I think that the arm angles are, are tough. And I, it, you've got to – there's been, I think, 34 infielders that have a Tommy John surgery in the last 30 years. So it's rare that it would happen to an infielder. Most of them in the high 90s come back as good as they were before the, uh, before the surgery. But I do think it's, it's really a wear and tear injury that, that builds up like that. A couple more questions on the Dodgers yeah. specifically before we move on with Ned Coletti. You're the perfect person to ask about what gives with Kenley Jansen since you were the guy who said maybe we should make you a reliever. Yeah. So what, I mean, this is a, pretty much the first adversity he's ever faced in yeah. this position. He's looking mortal all of a sudden. Most relievers eventually do. What's your evaluation of what, what ails Jansen well, this you know, year? I think it's really related to, uh, to spring training in a lot of ways. I think the Dodgers last year were really wise in how they used their pitching. They were very judicious in how they used their starters. I think Kershaw led the staff with 175 innings. Typically, you'll see somebody go 210, 220, then pitch the month of October on top of that. They were very judicious in all their usage, and I think it carries over to the spring. Kenley threw hardly at all this spring in, in regular spring training games. And it was really to kind of give him maybe an extra month to, to recoup. You play till November 1st. Your offseason is a month shorter than the teams that didn't make it. Plus, it's a different month of October is different than any other month you're ever going to play. I think all that stuff adds up. So I think they were wise and kind of you know, keeping them back a little bit in the spring. And I think that that's what you're seeing. You're still seeing him come out of spring training. Really, it's probably it's probably a week in my mind, maybe a week into the regular season now, even though we're a month in. But as far as his development this year, I think I think it was wise to to wait. This team is built for October. So they know that that's the month they're going to have to really have everybody in the best best spot that they can be in. And far be it for me or anybody, I guess, to tell Dave Roberts, a perennial manager of the year candidate, yep. how to handle his players or know how to push a button. I mean, Yasiel Puig is a perfect example 
of yep. how to rehabilitate a um, a player that needs that sort of mental rehab. So what what is the scoop with benching Cody Bellinger? I mean, that didn't. Yep. I, I saw the play. It didn't look like he was jaking it to me. Does it? Does this kid? Was he reading his press clippings a little bit? No, you know, uh, know, that's the one thing. And I've I've learned a lot in my thirty some years in the in the sport. There's a lot of things I don't know, and I don't know what goes on behind closed doors, and I don't know all conversations that do take place. I have great respect for Dave Roberts. I have great respect for Cody Bellinger, and it was one of those situations that hit a hit a flashpoint. And, and Dave had, had seen enough and took him out of the game after doubling in the right center field at, in San Francisco, thinking he should have been on third base. You talk to Cody after the game, and Cody says, hey, when I, it was a breaking ball. By the time I finished my swing, I was down on one knee. By the time I got up and started running, I didn't want to get thrown out of third base. So there's, there's a, a thought process to his part of the, the right. play. But Dave Roberts is the manager, and Dave Roberts is going to, to set forth what he expects. We've all seen Dave Roberts as a player. Dave Roberts took nothing off ever. And not to say that Cody took that play off, but we don't know all the detail that, is, that has transpired. He, uh, he did what he did. Uh, Dave Roberts said what he said, and I think that they put it behind him and they'll move forward. I think it's a lesson to be learned. And I think that Cody's a respectful enough player and person that probably won't ever happen again. All right, I want to take a break. And, uh, Ned, you come back. Well, I want to hit you on this ridiculous epidemic of strikeouts oh, yeah. in Major League Baseball. Uh, more strikeouts and hits in a month for the first time ever. Uh, we're already off to a roaring start in May with James Paxton striking out 16 batters and the Yankees and the Astros having half the outs be, more than half the outs be strikeouts in a 4 nothing game. Uh, and what ails this sport and how it can be fixed? Because to me, that's more of a, of a problem than pace of play. To me. Okay. okay. And then uh, I want to hit on, on a couple other items. But we hit uh, in earlier on it. The, the 3,000 hit club that Pujols is going to get it and who might be the next one to get in. If, are we are we seeing just a changing of the way that the sport is played and so much more? Uh, 844-204-RICH is the number to dial. Those who are on hold for hashtag Dear Del Tufo, stay on hold. That's going to be coming up after our chat with Ned Coletti here on The Rich Eisen Show. Ned Coletti, former Dodgers GM and analyst right now for uh, Sportsnet LA here in studio. And uh, breaking news, I, you know, we were talking about the 3,000 hit club and Pujols is going to join it. Uh, current active leaders in hits, Ichiro Suzuki, number one with 3,089, and Adrian Beltre just 14 behind him to catch him. Adrian Beltre is now the active leader because Ichiro just retired today. And announced that the Mariners wow. announcing just five minutes ago, the word coming out of the Pacific Northwest, that he is retiring and is transitioning to a role as the special assistant to the chairman of the Seattle Mariners. An active presence with the Major League Club will be set at both at home in Seattle and on the road. Ichiro Suzuki's Hall of Fame career. Tremendous career. Is over. Now... Yes. It was this so Ichiro just I guess deciding to stop playing and him going to the front office prevents him from being signed by another club, correct? Yeah, but or, if he if he's done playing, he's he's, he's probably done playing. He probably wanted to finish where he began in this country, you know. But when you think about what he did, and he didn't start here until he was about twenty seven or twenty eight years old. Right. He wasn't a twenty one, twenty two year old coming up and had an extra five or six years. He he started late and still Oh yeah, yeah. What a what a tremendous career. What do, will you say to people who call him the all time hit king, more than Pete Rose? Because you can add in what he did in yeah. Japan to on top to the of the three thousand eighty nine hits. I think has. it's apples and oranges to some extent. Pitching's different. Situations are different. So apples and oranges. Apples three thousand eighty nine career hits for Ichiro Suzuki. Yep. Tremendous baseball. Oh player. yeah. Just tremendous slap hitter, everywhere. May have had a shot of four thousand had he come here at twenty one, twenty two years old. Correct. You know. Uh, instead, uh, pool holes, too shy of the 3,000 hit club. You looked at the list that we were looking at before, yeah. and the four check marks that I have that anybody with a chance to get to 3,000 hits, I've got Cabrera, Miguel Cabrera, who is about 304, he's exactly 335 hits shy. Robinson Cano, who is 594 hits shy. And then Jose Altuve and Mike Trout, who are in the thousands right now. Altuve is about 1,700-plus hits shy, and Trout almost 2,000 hits shy, but because of their age, 
Those are the only ones on this list. You took a look at the li yeah. rest of this list. Do you agree? I agree. Assessment? I agree. Certainly with, with Cabrera and Cano. The other two players, Trout and Altuve, are tremendous players. But there's so much time that they're going to have to play to get to that point. That's a long way to go yet. And you got different things that happen. Injuries happen, different things. They're certainly talented enough to get there. But longevity is up to time. You know, that's up to father time sometimes. Yeah, I'm going to task El Zuro, the Rich Eisen Show researcher, with something. What is the longest span in between 3,000 hit club uh, entries? Because we might be Ooh. staring oh, that yeah. down in the face right now. Yes. Uh, why is that? Why is it, is it because of the, the number of strikeouts? Can we draw a line between the current seeming epidemic yep. that just happened in April, first month in the history of Major League Baseball, more strikeouts than hits? Can we draw a straight line from that to, to this list that we're talking about right here? Well, I, probably in time. I don't know if we can do that right here, right now, because it's, it's just the epidemic has been a little bit of a growing concern, but really the last month, really a, a great concern. But I do think players maybe don't play as long as they used to. And I think that you're going to see that list become rarer and rarer. The 300 win club, I think you may have seen the last one for a long time. Yeah, I mean, we're looking before at you Before you see another pitcher win 300 games. Yeah, Bartolo Colon's not making it. Although, man, he is. What's going on with that? Well, Did you see how he's getting from uh, from the mound to first base, too? <laughs> how about that? Him going, him going uh, you know, scoreless, uh, no-hit scoreless innings for no-hit scoreless innings with Verlander a couple weeks ago. Oh, yeah. Then there's CC. Then there's Verlander, who's 108 wins shy. Granky, Felix, and well, I mean, who's going to catch it? Kershaw is 155 wins shy yeah. right now. He's in it's, year 11. He's well, one of the best pitchers in the era, and still not not halfway there. Now the reason for that is what lack of complete games, or this whole business of, or, or is it A the met, bit. or is it the metric of taking pitchers out because they just happen to be in the third go round of of the batting order? I think all all of it adds up. All of it adds up to to less wins, uh, but I do think that it's. I don't know if players are going to play as long. The season is a grind. The season takes its toll uh, on everybody. And I don't know if the appetite will be there to continue to pitch. When you think about winning 300 games, you're talking about a lot of victories and a lot of seasons, tremendous amount of seasons in the upper echelon of your, of your win group. Think about 20-game winners. We haven't seen a lot of those either. Once in a while, you'll see it. The record that will never be broken, probably Ripken with the Lou Gehrig consecutive game streaks. Right. Complete games. Obsolete. Obsolete. Well, and 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 another through line can be drawn from from what I'm hearing from our guests that have been on this show, Plesak, Al Leiter, Smoltz, just to name some pitchers, is the fact of the specialization of the bullpen. Yes. Also leads to more strikeouts because it's different no pitchers. Doubt. Live arms, different arm angles, one inning after another yes. after another. That's adding to more strikeouts. You know, we saw this kid Josh Hader strike out. Eight, he went yep. for eight for eight the other night. Yes. For, yes. The, for the Milwaukee Brewers. But what about the mindset of the prospect? Are you seeing different from you yep. and your, your, your days to the current days that you're now seeing as an analyst? Do kids just, are they taught at, at an age now, just don't worry about the strikeout? Is that what they're being taught? That's a lot of it. A strikeout used to end a career as a nine-year-old. If, if you couldn't hit as a nine-year-old and struck out, you were done. That's no longer the case. And I think that in player development, I think people are teaching loft. They're teaching put the ball in the air. They're teaching you know power pays and, and go for the long ball. And if you strike out, you strike out. Because it used to be nobody, nobody wanted to strike out. And if you looked at it, the all-time strikeout leaders and, and as hitters were some of the great power hitters of all time. It was a dynamic that they held. But now as you look at who leads leagues in strikeouts and who strikes out a lot, it's a six hitter. It's a seventh hitter. It's not the three, four, five guys. It's, it's pretty much all the way up and down that lineup. I think kids are taught different. I think the emphasis is on power more than putting the ball on play. And you rarely see a hitter with a two strike approach. You used to always see hitters Choke up, go to right field, at least make contact, move a runner along, make it a productive out. You don't see a lot of that. You'll see it once in a while with some of the greats, but you don't see it as as a integral part of a strategic mind of a hitter. So how much is analytics playing a role in this? Uh, it, it could play a big role in it. You know, there's there's numbers that say that you know you're going to score X number of runs by putting a ball in the air. That that's that's how to do it. Uh, it could be that, but I, I do think that there's only. There's one thing worse than a strikeout in the, in the game. Well, kind of two, a triple play, but really a double play. Because a strikeout gets you nothing. And the, I mean, when you flip it, and you talked about the relievers that some of those pitchers brought up, 
the the idea that you could come in and get a strikeout sometimes is necessary. As a relief pitcher, you don't need a fly ball. You don't need a ground ball in the hole or something that can drive a runner in or move a runner along. You need that strikeout. So I think it plays into that role, too, because the bullpens are different and they are better. Years ago, you had starting a starting rotation and a closer. Then a setup guy became mm-hmm. the next level. Then a lefty, a left on left guy. Then maybe a lefty setup guy. And so little by little, you've crawled this back. But as you put together your pitching staff, your 12th or 13th pitcher are typically the ones that are borderline that are going to be interchangeable as time goes on. If they're going to stick in the show. They're going to have to strike guys out. Well, Ned Coletti here on the Rich Eisen Show. What can be done about it? Because something has to be done. Because to me, and I've said this uh, many times, I'll say it again with you here. Baseball has to realize, forget time of game. I would rather see a ton of hits and it takes three three hours and 20 minutes. I really would. Than to see what I saw with the Yankees and the Astros the other night, which was no score at all. 28 of the 54 outs in the game were strikeouts. More than half were strikeouts. And I would rather see something fixed with the strikeouts because you're, you're seeing no action at all. Zero action. And that's a problem in the 21st century. No, no. We all need to see something. So what, does, what should baseball do? And I will then give you a suggestion that I had to bounce that one off you. What, what should baseball do for a fix? Philosophies are tough to change. And I think they, ha- they can only change when, when there's such – mounting evidence that it's it's hurting your club, hurting your organization. I think then it changes back. But until that point, I think everything will stay stay the way it is and may get worse. It, it's it's sad to see, it's sad to talk about or it, it's against my, you know, traditional belief on on how the game is best played. But I think until teams lose so much because of a philosophy that's in place like like swing hard and Try to loft exit and get launch an angle, and you know we're going to live on, on on exit velocity until the, until that is a philosophical change because your team is losing ninety to hundred games a year with that philosophy. I think it 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 stays and it runs its course. Well, how about getting rid of the shift? Make it because football, yeah. just to use the analogy, football has changed some rules to benefit the offense, more scoring defensive penalties yep. and 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 they put the onus on the defense quite a bit to keep your hands off of receivers can't hit the quarterback in a certain way can't touch a receiver in a certain way scoring goes up more and more people are enjoying fantasy football in that regard potentially what about removing the shift and making it easier to get singles doubles? You know, I, I go back and forth on it i you know the shift uh it used to be rare that you'd ever see a shift i knew lou boudreau who allegedly had the first shift against ted williams you know, 60, 70 years ago, and it was rare you'd ever see it. Now you see it every game. I go back and forth on it because I, I do think, you know, it's a little bit overdone, but there is a way to break it, too. They have not they have not made the playing field, fair territory, less square footage. As a hitter, if you're a left-handed hitter and they got everybody over to the right side, you got to hit the ball down the left field line or bunt the ball down the third base line. Do that. And I but think nobody's that, nobody's nobody spent the last several years going to Fenway Park hoping to see Poppy bunt his way on. I mean, you've got to think about the greater I good I of attention it. and I eyeballs it. and and excitement and buzz and tweeting videos out. Nobody's tweeting out. The only strikeouts I saw tweeted out were this kid, you know, hater because there were eight of them in eight right, at bats. Right. You know, this is the metric that needs to be focused on when you're going deeper into the 21st century here for eyeballs. Well, I'm not sure what you're going to do about it. You know, but maybe that's why they swing hard and, and loft <laughs> so they can hit it over the shift. But that's what know. I that's what I was saying the other day. Again, that the sh- you get rid of the shift, maybe fewer people will try and hit it, you know, into the shift and, and instead of over it. Yeah. Well, I think a good hitter, a guy like Tony Gwynn, made a living going the opposite way. It would be so hard to shift on Tony Gwynn. It'd be almost impossible. He was a hitter that could hit to off fields. Sure, if you're a Red Sox fan, you want to see Big Poppy hit it out into the bullpen, you know, mm-hmm. or hit it over the monster. But at the same time, to play the game, to win the game, a defense, if a defense knows that you're likely to do that, and that you may drop the ball down a third baseline, or you can just slap it down. A th- the guy we just talked about at the outset of this, this segment, I- Ichiro, yeah. master at it. How do you shift on that? You can't shift on that because what you end up going to do, you're going to end up giving up a double instead of a single if you're, if you're playing it wrong defensively. That takes it out of the game. They shift because it's a, it's a percentage play that this is where this player is going to hit the ball because history tells us 
this is what they do. Sometimes you got to change your history, your personal history to, to change it up. Ned, great chat, man. All I enjoyed right. this. Pleasure. Let's, uh, you're just down the street. We're Anytime. here. Anytime. Let's do this more often. Anytime. You got My it, pleasure. Ned Coletti. And, uh, and your book is still available, obviously. Yeah, on, absolutely. On, Doing on, well. Bestseller. On, online bookstores everywhere. Uh, the Big Chair, Smooth Hops and Bad Bounces from the Inside World of the Acclaimed Los Angeles Dodgers General Manager. Good to see you, Ned. Thank you, sir. The Rich Eisen Show, weekdays at noon Eastern on Audience.